Canon 6 of the Second Ecumenical Council says, if anyone lay a personal grievance, that is a private complaint against a bishop on the grounds that he has been a victim of the bishop's greed or other unjust treatment. In the case of such accusations, neither the personality nor the religion of the accuser is to be inquired into, for the conscience of the bishop must be clear in every respect, and the man who claims to have been wronged should receive justice, whatever be his religion." End quote. This video is a complaint about Bishop Sirtis Black in particular and the GOC under Metropolitan Pavlos in general. A few years ago, I discovered the genuine Orthodox Church under Metropolitan Pavlos and decided to join them. However, there was no GOC parish anywhere near where I lived. Then in 2010, I flew to New York and joined the GOC. I went to the GOC with good, honest, and sincere intentions and was obedient to the GOC's ecclesiology even before I joined them, and I did not attend any mainstream Orthodox parish since the GOC considers them to be apostate. My faithfulness to the GOC caused me much isolation and hardship since I did not have the benefit of a local parish to attend. My commitment to the GOC and the isolation this commitment caused me augmented my already pre-existing conditions of major depression and anxiety. I went to the GOC with sincere and honest intentions and demonstrated an interest in monasticism. I donated money to the GOC's Estigmental Monastery on Mount Athos and to the GOC's Homeless Ministry in New York a few times. Each time I donated to the Homeless Ministry, Bishop Christodoulos emailed me thanking me for the donation, except the last time possibly because I was exposed in the GOC's 2002 encyclical violations at that time. One time the GOC was asking for donations for the so-called true Orthodox Serbian nuns who were, living, who were visiting the United States and I sent the nuns $100. I never received any thank you notice or receipt from the GOC for this donation even though Father Stephen and I tried to get a receipt. It's possible the reason I did not receive a thank you notice or receipt is because at that time I had videos exposing the fact that GOC gives communion to new calendarists in violation of their own 2002 encyclical which absolutely forbids this action. The reason I wanted a receipt for that particular donation is because I sent a money order but left it blank and did not fill it out because I did not know who to make it out to. I explained this in the letter. No thank you and no receipt was ever given. Father Stephen told me that they were not giving receipts or personal thank you notices for that particular charity. This may or may not be true. As previously noted, the GOC has a policy of giving community to new calendarists in violation of their own 2002 encyclical and the old calendars protocol 13. I was patient with the GOC because the GOC priest Father Maximus had told me that the GOC's practice of giving communion to new calendars was going to stop. It never did. Father Maximus had even told me that he agreed with my arguments for why GOC clergy are not allowed to commune new calendarists. I met Father Maximus in 2010 and sometime during my correspondence with him I explained to him that I have major depressive disorder and anxiety problems, and sometime during my correspondence with Father Maximus, I explained to him that a psychologist I saw in 2009 had said that the situation with orthodoxy is not helping me. During the days I was regularly corresponding with Father Maximus, he told me that I needed to be around people. But when I tried to be around orthodox people, I was prevented by Bishop Sturgis Black, as we shall see in a moment. During my visit, I briefly explained to Father Maximus that repentance is difficult, but obeying the rules of the church is easy, so I did not understand why their clergy give communion to new calendarists. He said that some of their clergy have a hard time obeying the church. During my visit, Father Maximus told me that he had spoken with Bishop Christodoulos and said that Bishop Christodoulos had given his permission for me to join their monastery. But when he was driving me to the bus stop, the bus took me to the airport. Father Maximus told me not to make any plans until I had heard from him through email. I returned home and a few days later Father Maximus emailed me and said that they had decided that I attended parish for a year before I joined the monastery. I was surprised by this instruction because Father Maximus knew there was no GOC parish anywhere near where I lived. I was willing to comply but I always had a certain hesitation of joining that monastery since the GOC gives communion to new calendars. However, Father Maximus had told me that he does not give communion to new calendars at the monastery. Vladimir Moss had once told me that if I ever witnessed a clergyman at that monastery giving communion to a new calendarist, then to leave the monastery. That's how serious this violation is as far as Vladimir Moss was concerned. I told this to Father Maximus and he said he did not agree with Vladimir Moss. And in an email dated July 6, 2010, he said the devil would arrange this in order to drive me out of that monastery. A reason Father Maximus gave for why they had decided that I attend a parish for a year before I joined the monastery was because, according to him, 
I needed to regain trust in clergy and Christians in general. The problem with this advice, whether true or contrived, is that even if true, the GOC has not given me any reason why I should trust them, as we shall see in a moment. Father Maximus had told me that he had spoken with an older woman who lived near the monastery, and she had consented to letting me live with her until I fulfilled the year term. I did consider moving in with her, but I was hesitant because I was unsure if the GOC was going to stop their practice of giving communion to new calendars, and I was thinking of going to S. Figmental Monastery instead. In 2011, GOC priest Father Maximus pointed me to Bishop Sergius Black since Bishop Sergius was transitioning to the GOC from Hakna. Even though Bishop Sergius Monastery and Church was over a two-hour drive from where I lived, I was willing to make that struggle with my car, which was in fair condition. An interesting thing about this is that Father Maximus pointed me to Bishop Sergius even before Bishop Sergius had made the official transition from Hakna into the GOC. Father Maximus told me to use my own discretion or discernment or something along those lines as to whether or not I wanted to go to Bishop Sergius since he was still in Hakna. I never understood why he said that because Orthodox Church teaching has already has already told me how I am to respond. Hakna is heretical and schismatic even by so-called true Orthodox Church standards and the Holy Fathers and Canons of the Church teach us not to pray with heretics and schismatics. I asked Vladimir Moss about this and he told me not to go to Bishop Sergius Church until he had made the transition into the GOC. Vladimir Moss gave the correct TOC advice on this as far as so-called True Orthodox Church teaching is concerned. Before I visited Bishop Sergius, I contacted Vladimir Moss and asked him if Bishop Sergius had made the official transition yet. I was told he had, so I contacted Bishop Sergius to see about a visit. A time was arranged for me to go down for a visit. Before I went down to Bishop Sergius Church, I told him in an email that the devil was going to try to ruin our relationship. I was only there one night, and everything went well. One of the monks, Father Patrick, asked me if I could stay a few days longer because a special day on the Orthodox calendar was approaching. I can't remember what day it was. I declined. Father Patrick told me that it was not by coincidence that I was visiting on the day of St. Siloan the Athenite. Father Patrick suggested to me that I try to relocate down to that area so I could be closer to the monastery. During my visit with Bishop Sergius in his office, I made known to him my unhappiness about the fact GOC clergy give communion to new calendarists, and I told him how I had previously made some videos on YouTube about Metropolitan Paulus and Bishop Christodoulos, but at that time all those videos had been removed. I noticed in church a mosaic of Christ on the wall. I asked Father Patrick if I could have a print of that mosaic. He said he would mail me one, but he never did. I asked Bishop Sergius if I could live at the monastery until I could eventually get to S. Figmental Monastery on Mount Athos because that was where I was intending to go. I had decided not to join the monastery in New York. I thought it would be good I thought it would be spiritually and psychologically good for me to be around people of similar faith. Bishop Sergius told me to talk to the monastery board about this. When I asked Father Patrick about this, he immediately said he did not think it would be a good idea. I got the impression from him that he had been instructed by Bishop Sergius how to answer me, although I have no proof Bishop Sergius instructed him on what to tell me. But if Bishop Sergius did tell him what to say, why did he have him do his dirty work? Why wasn't he honest enough with me to tell me himself? At Trapezo, there were guests visiting, and Bishop Sergius introduced me to the guests and said that he hopes my visit to the monastery would be the first of many visits. I left the monastery on perfectly good terms. Father Patrick invited me to stay a few days longer, and he suggested to me that I move down to that area so I could be closer to the monastery. Father Patrick was wonderful. Even though I did not ask for it, he gave me $50 to help with the gas during my long drive home and a few small laminated icons. He assured me that he would mail the icon print of Christ that I requested. He never did. My overall feeling about the monks was that they were very nice and hospitable. I got home and was happy that I had finally found a true bishop and true orthodox believers. It seemed like a miracle. I was happy that I would no longer be isolated and separated from church. I emailed some people, including one person who was looking for a spiritual father, and told them about Bishop Sergius. A few days went by, and I emailed St. Gregory's Sunday Monastery to see about another visit. Bishop Sergius did not answer my emails. Finally, he answered my question. No, I could not go back for a visit. No reason was given. Struck by the sudden and unexpected change in his personality, 
I asked for an explanation for this. No explanation was given. During those days, I emailed Bishop Sergius and asked if he had ever been made a Jesuit because he had told me when I was visiting that he had attended a Jesuit school. He did not answer my question until I asked a second time. He said he was never a Jesuit and had never been a Roman Catholic. I also sent him some links to various articles condemning the modernist understanding of homosexuality. This may have been inappropriate for me, but the reason I sent that information is because I had an intuitive feeling when I met Bishop Sergius that he was a homosexual. I asked Bishop Sergius several times if I could go back for a visit so I could attend church, and he would not let me. He even prevented me from attending the Nativity Service of 2011 and the Pascha Service of 2012. Flabbergasted at his total change in personality, I asked him and other GOC clergy what my sinner crime was that was apparently so severe that it prevented me from being able to go to church, and that whatever it was, assuming a sinner crime existed, the church could not remedy the situation. There was no reply from Bishop Sergius. In a later response to me, Bishop Sergius was adamant, determined, and insistent that I absolutely could not go to his church, not even for Pascha. I then proceeded to inform various GOC clergy, including Metropolitan Moses, Bishop Photius, Father Stephen Allen, Father Savas of Florida, and Father Maximus, the priest who had originally pointed me to Bishop Sergius, and explained to them that Bishop Sergius was not letting me go to church. At the end of my email to Metropolitan Moses, I even signed with the common phrase, with love in Christ. Metropolitan Moses wrote me back and said he wanted to know who my spiritual father was. I didn't give him a name because I didn't have one, and besides, it was irrelevant. Bishop Photius never once responded to me, and Father Stephen and Father Savas showed absolutely no concern whatsoever. Father Maximus of New York once wrote me back and said that no one was keeping me away from church. I replied to him and explained that that was not true. Bishop Sergius was, in fact, not allowing me to go to church. I did not hear back from Father Maximus. Some, some time prior to this email, Father Maximus and Vladimir Moss had told me to just go, to just show up at Bishop Sergius' church. They understood that what Bishop Sergius had done was wrong. I informed Estig Mental Monastery about what Bishop Sergius had done, and the monk that replied said Bishop Sergius could not keep me out of church, but he could keep me out of the monastery. I need to emphasize that a clergyman is bound by the holy canons. A bishop does not have the right to unilaterally and on his own selfish accord to ban a person from church out of passion or just because he feels like it. I had never been excommunicated from the GOC for any sin, heresy, or schism. Therefore, Bishop Sergius did not have the right to keep me away from church. I believe an excommunicated person, which I am not, has the right to stand in the nave of the church. Bishop Sergius did not even want me in the church at all. Sometime after these events, I called Father Maximus in New York, and he told me that he had spoken to Bishop Sergius about this, but that he did not remember what Bishop Sergius had said. He may or may not have been lying, but Father Maximus never bothered to contact me to inform me that he had spoken with him. It was only after I called Father Maximus that I learned that he had spoken with Bishop Sergius. I then again informed several GOC clergymen about these events, including Father Stephen Allen, Father Savas of Florida, Metropolitan Moses, Bishop Photius, Father Maximus, several priests in the GOC headquarters in Greece, telling them what Bishop Sergius had done, what the psychologist in 2009 had said, and how I have major depressive disorder. To this day, these clergymen have not done anything about this situation. If they have, it has never been made known to me. There has been a complete absence of Christian love, empathy, compassion, and a sense of justice in these people. I reiterate, I have never been formally charged or excommunicated from the GOC for any sin, heresy, or schism. I later emailed every single GOC clergyman whose email address is listed on the GOC website and told them about what Bishop Sturgis had done. Not one GOC clergyman has done anything to defend my right to repent and to attend the only church I had. Father Maximus had suggested that I relocate, but I shouldn't have to since there was a perfectly good church just over two hours away. Also, relocating would require tremendous financial resources, which I did not have. I emailed Bishop Sturgis and quoted some relevant scriptural passages in Apostolic Canons 52 and 58. Apostolic Canon 52 says, If any bishop or presbyter shall refuse to welcome back anyone returning from sin, but on the contrary rejects him, let him be deposed from office, since he grieves Christ who said, There is joy in heaven over a single sinner who repenteth. End quote. Part of the interpretation of this canon, which I did not send him, refers to such a clergyman as an antichrist because he is thwarting Christ. 
Apostolic Canon 58. If any bishop or presbyter neglects the clergy or the lady and fails to instruct them in piety, let him be excommunicated. But if he persists in his negligence and indolence, let him be deposed from office. Bishop Sturgis did not respond. As noted earlier, I appealed to various GOC clergymen explaining these things to them in some detail with the relevant apostolic canons, and there has been complete indifference and apathy in these people. I also informed these clergymen that I have major depressive disorder and that a psychologist I saw in 2009 said the situation with orthodoxy is not helping me. Absolutely no regard for the psychologist's statement for my depression and my good intentions to attend church has come from these people. One time shortly after the Pascha service that Bishop Sturgis had banned me from, he replied to one of my emails and signed with the common phrase, Christ is risen, knowing that he had intentionally kept me away from the Pascha service. Also, during the Nativity Fast of 2011, as a gesture of goodwill, I emailed Bishop Sturgis and asked if I could take vitamin D3 during the fast. He never answered. It was difficult getting responses from him, but one time he replied and said that he had consistently maintained that the reason why I could not go down to his church was because since I was against the GOC clergy giving communion to heretics, it would not be good for me to be in a church I believe to be heretical. A response to his comment is necessary here. First, he had never consistently maintained anything. I had asked him on several different occasions why I could not attend church. He just simply would not answer. But I think one time he may have said something to that effect, but I can't be certain. Second, I never claimed the GOC was heretical. I was just simply protesting the 2002 encyclical violations as any true GOC person would. As a new GOC bishop, Sergius should have been happy that I was zealous for GOC ecclesiology. Third, I told Father Maximus, the priest who had originally referred me to Bishop Sergius, the reason Bishop Sergius had given, and he said his reason was false. He said most of the genuine Orthodox Christians, including himself, are against their clergymen giving communion to heretics, and he said Bishop Sergius will have to answer to God for this. I want to point out here and emphasize that if we carried Bishop Sergius' reason through to its logical conclusion, it would mean the majority of the GOC Christians, including Father Maximus, could no longer attend church GOC parishes, which is, of course, ludicrous. But I'm assuming Sergius' excuse was real and not contrived. I have never in my life heard of someone being banned from a church for believing in the doctrine of that church. To this day, not one single GOC clergyman has done anything about this situation. Now, with regard to the icon print that Father Patrick said he would mail me, it never came. When I was home and several days had passed, the icon never appeared in my mailbox. I emailed the monastery and asked about it and offered to pay for the shipping. I never received a reply and never received the icon. Several months ago, I called the monastery and spoke with Father Patrick. Bishop Sergius was away at that time. Father Patrick told me he had forgotten to mail me the icon, which was probably a lie. The real reason he didn't send it was probably because Bishop Sergius instructed him not to. When I was speaking with Father Patrick, he said he would mail it to me, but when Bishop Sergius returned to the monastery, he probably prevented him from sending it because I never received it. As a bishop, Sergius is expected to unite people to Christ, inspire hope, and unite people to the church, not separate people from Christ and the church. When I was talking to Father Patrick on the phone, he told me we live in difficult times. I hear this a lot. It's like a cliche in Orthodox circles. But who's making it difficult? Answer, the clergy. They create unnecessary problems when there's absolutely no reason for them. Father Patrick told me that Bishop Sergius was lighting candles for me in church. I could not believe Bishop Sergius' audacity before God. Bishop Sergius is solely responsible for me not being able to attend church and for this video. Why light candles for me when all he has to do is totally neutralize the scandal by writing me and saying, Hello brother, by all means come down to church. Does this man accept any responsibility for anything? I can't believe his audacity before God. I then emailed Bishop Sergius and asked him about the candles he lights in church and asked him if he accepts any responsibility for anything, but he did not reply. Obviously he doesn't care about me, so why is he praying for me? Isn't the desire to go to church a good sign? How exactly is he expecting God to answer his prayers? It is my opinion that the only reason he lit candles for me is because he wanted to save face in front of his monks. He knows what he did and he is solely responsible for it. When I was talking to Father Patrick on the phone, I told him how Bishop Sturgis had violated my right to attend church. He said something that totally shocked me. He said Christians don't have rights. That is totally false and something you would hear in a cult. Christians have the right to repent and attend church. 
Bishop, bishops are bound by the canons and the teaching of the church. They cannot ban someone from church, such as myself, who has never been charged or accused of heresy, schism, or excommunicated for any sin. I believe excommunicated people, which I'm not, had the right to stand in the nave of the church. Bishop Sergius didn't even want me in the church building. Second, if Christians don't have rights, then Bishop Sergius did not have the right to push me away from church. In our brief talk, Father Patrick suggested that I try the humble approach. I had already done this, but it completely failed. I had told Bishop Sergius before that there was nothing he could ever do to turn me against him except heresy, but I received no reply. Besides, where is Bishop Sergius' humility? I tried to work with Bishop Sergius and show I was willing to pardon his shortcomings. I even showed my goodwill and once emailed him asking if I could have vitamin D3 during the nativity fast. He never answered. I had once asked Father Savas on the phone who I could appeal to in the GOC to report what Bishop Sergius did, and he never answered the question. He told me to try the humble approach with Bishop Sergius, but I was way past that. The humble approach had failed. Besides, the humble approach is for someone who is actually guilty of something. I had never been excommunicated from the GOC for any sin, heresy, schism, or crime. As I have explained, I reported to the GOC clergy what Bishop Sirtis did to me, and to this day absolutely none of their clergy have done anything to defend my right to attend the only GOC parish I had, and to this day not one GOC clergy has ever bothered to contact me to see if my right to attend church was restored, to hear a confession, or to see how I am doing. I believe the GOC has lost its Christianity and humanity, evident signs that they are in pre -list. I believe the GOC is in the hands of incompetent people, and I believe their first priority is about making money and building their jurisdiction. In direct violation of their own 2002 encyclical and Greek Old Calendars Protocol 13 and the teaching of St. John of Damascus, who instructed us not to give communion to heretics or we will be partakers in their dishonor and condemnation. It is reprehensible when a church puts the politics, jurisdiction, and money before the spiritual and psychological needs of their own people. These are selfish people who have no idea what it is like being isolated, having major depressive disorder, anxiety, not having a parish to attend, and being deprived of the sacraments for years. I want to emphasize here that I went to the GOC on perfectly good and sincere terms, trying to repent, wanting to be reconciled to Christ, willing to accept any penance and go to church, sending them money, praying for them, and wanting to join a monastery. Instead of appreciating this and embracing me like Christ would do, I was unjustly pushed away by the people I should have been able to look up to and trust. I am now going to quote a statement that was sent to me last summer from a zealot in Greece. It's translated from Greek into English. We live in difficult times and spirituality has been downgraded. In the genuine Orthodox Church, we have bishop leaders passionate without spirituality. They conflict, quarrel, they are divided and create groups with their similar fans. They do not enter into the kingdom of heaven but also they prevent those who want to enter, for example, you, Euthemios, and anyone else who is searching to find the genuine church of Christ." End quote. It is interesting that this seller wrote me these words because I did not tell him anything about what Bishop Sergius had done. I sent this comment to Bishop Sergius and some of the GOC clergy I have described in this video, but there was no reply. Even if I had a misunderstanding about them, there has been no effort from them to clarify and resolve this issue in my mind and to bring it to rest. There is complete indifference and absolutely no humility and no Christian compassion and love in these people. I believe the evidence indicates that these people suffer from what Father Seraphim Rose called the supercorrectness disease because they lack Christian love and compassion, but they are not even consistent in their supercorrectness because since the 2002 encyclical is being violated, they are hypocrites. In addition to lacking Christian love and human empathy, they also lack pastoral concern, missionary zeal, and a love for justice. If you do not love justice, then you do not truly love God. Things did not start out this way. I went to the GOC in an amicable way, wanting to be united to Christ, attend church, accept any penance for my sins, sending them money, praying for them, and wanting to join a monastery. But when I realized there would be no support and no justice in the case of Bishop Sergius Black, and that their giving communion to new calendars was not going to stop, I decided to expose them publicly for being the frauds and hypocrites they are. Another thing about Bishop Sergius is that I once told him that there was nothing he could ever do to turn me against him except heresy, and I told him I was willing to accept any penance for my sins. There was absolutely no regard for my good intentions whatsoever. I communicated to GOC clergy the events described here and about my major depressive illness and what the psychologist said in 2009 
and that Bishop Sturgis violated my right to attend church, and there's been a complete absence of Christian concern, love, empathy, compassion, and justice. Now, I believe Father Maximus was originally more responsible than the other clergy for my current plight because of the following reasons. First, he is a priest who pointed me to Bishop Sturgis Church. Second, he knows about my major depressive disorder and what the psychologist said in 2009. Third, Father Maximus once told me that I needed to be around people, but when I tried to be around people by going to Bishop Sturgis Church, which was the only church I had, I was prevented, and Father Maximus, like the others, has not defended my right to attend that church. Fourth, Father Maximus once suggested to me that I relocate. I don't have to relocate when there is a perfectly good church just a couple hours away. Also, I never had the funds to just get up and leave. Fifth, Father Maximus knows that I cannot relocate because he gave me his permission to receive orthodontist treatment for two impacted teeth, which requires braces, and I told him on the phone that I am now obligated to stay at my present location because of my contract with the orthodontist. I tried to get out of receiving the orthodontist treatment, but Father Maximus encouraged me to receive it. He told me, get the braces, end quote. So he knows the situation and knows I cannot leave. Sixth, like the other clergy mentioned here, Father Maximus has never once bothered to check up on me hear, to hear a confession, see if my right to attend church was restored, or to see how I am doing. I shouldn't have to go through this situation. Instead of assuring me that God loves me and trying to alleviate my major depression and anxiety and proving that the GOC is better than what they call mainstream orthodoxy and proving that these GOC people can actually behave like Christians and trying to alleviate my major depressive disorder by bringing joy into my life, by at least allowing me to attend church and showing some compassion, by at least checking on me from time to time, there has been nothing but cold and callous indifference from the GOC under Metropolitan Pavlos. In fact, I would say that the clergymen, the clergymen belonging to Metropolitan Paulos are the most ruthless and inhuman Christians I have ever seen in my life, but they're good actors if they think people are watching them, or if they think you're going to play ball by going along with their egregious 2002 encyclical violations. I assure you that if you go against the 2002 encyclical violations, they will drop you like a hot potato and dump you off the side of the road like you never existed. I have checked with Father Maximus a few times regarding the injustice committed against me by Bishop Sergius, and Father Maximus has been completely indifferent. Why have these people behaved in such a cold, callous, and unchristian manner? There are at least six possibilities that I know of that may explain this. One, they want to help, but their hands are tied because they have been given an ungodly obedience not to assist me since I'm against the 2002 encyclical violations. I have always considered the possibility that Bishop Sturgis has been given a pseudo and corrupt obedience to push me away, although I have no proof. Two, the devil has them in a kind of hypnotic trance, prelust, and they are incapable of seeing how serious the situation is and what they are doing, since their cultic mindset does not allow them to open up and reach out to me like a normal, well-balanced, and decent human being would. Three, the GOC under Metropolitan Paulus is completely controlled by heretics or something worse. Four. They are undiagnosed psychopaths or sociopaths, completely mastered by pride, with no regard for human life whatsoever. And if I were to wither up and die or lose my faith, it wouldn't faze them at all, because in their sick minds I am completely disposable and expendable. 5. They are just completely incompetent. 6. All of the above. Now, because I believe the actions of some clergy and heretics are not governed by biblical and Christian ethics and morality, as we see in the case of the slander of Metropolitan Paulus against Archbishop Gregory, I may get slandered as, as a result of this video. Please do not uncritically accept the version of events coming from a priest just because he is a priest and may be soft-spoken and perhaps an expert at presenting facades and covering his tracks and lying. I believe some of these kind of people are experts at covering up for each other, their cronies, and presenting a facade of being spiritual and pious when one is in their presence. The evidence here is clear, but because most people are authority-driven, they take the voice of their leaders over their own eyes and ears. In light of what I have described in this video, the passage from James 2, 15-16 comes to mind. If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you saying to them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding ye give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? I sent this passage to clergy mentioned in this video and never received a reply. Even if I had misinterpreted the biblical passages and the canons, which I haven't, 
absolutely no effort was put forward to resolve a possible misunderstanding about the canons and the relevant scriptural passages and to bring this issue to rest. All these things together indicate to me that the clergy mentioned in this video have absolutely no respect for me as a human being and as an Orthodox Christian. As far as they are concerned, I could just wither up and die and it wouldn't bother them whatsoever. As far as they are concerned, I'm completely expendable. As explained earlier, I have major depressive illness. I even told GOC clergy that people with this illness are known to commit suicide. Of course, there was not the slightest degree of compassion or concern. No response was given, but don't worry about me. I'm not going anywhere. These things have made me stronger and more determined than ever. And glory be to God, I have noticed over the past couple years that I'm getting better and better, not because of any example in the GOC, but because of the grace of God and the Theotokos. The conscience would bother a normal, decent person, but these people just go on with their lives like nothing ever happened with absolutely no regard for my spiritual, psychological, and physical well-being. The GOC is solely responsible for initiating this reaction in me and for this video. Bishop Sergius abuses his authority. My right to attend church is violated. None of their clergy defend my right to attend the only GOC parish I had, and the GOC violates their own 2002 encyclical, and they may wonder why I complain. What do they expect? Do these people accept any responsibility for anything? I may not be the most educated person in the world, but I am an adult and I know how the world works and what Christianity is. Everything I am as a person, as a Christian, and as a human being tells me that what the GOC has done is corrupt, wrong, and something you would see in a cult and victims of thought reform. Cults ignore doctor's statements and have absolutely no respect or regard for their people once they realize their people are not going to play ball by going along with their hypocrisy, duplicity, and violations. I also believe GOC clergy and clergy in other old calendar jurisdictions may suffer from certain aspects of thought reform as explained by Dr. Robert Lipton. Criteria number five, sacred science. The group's doctrine or ideology is considered to be the ultimate truth beyond all questioning or dispute. Truth is not to be found outside the group. The leader as the spokesperson for God or for all humanity is likewise above criticism, end quote. Historically, Metropolitan Paulus has been above criticism. Pavlos slandered GOC priest Father Gregory and was still made a Metropolitan in spite of the slander. Pavlos communu calendaris in spite of the prohibition given by the 2002 encyclical. This man Pavlos suffered from a stroke and was left partially paralyzed. And yet, because of his lack of fear of God, he just goes on in his pride and delusion and continues to distribute communion to new calendars and continues to maintain the slander against Archbishop Gregory. And yet he has the audacity to go to communion himself regularly, suffering from the delusion that he is somehow going to become sanctified even though he is maintaining sin in his life. A couple years ago, Bishop Christodoulos wrote me and said that they stand by what Pablo said about Archbishop Gregory. Folks, they are maintaining the slander, which is obviously a lie. Read the documented evidence for yourself. I myself have already been slandered in a forum, but because people are so indifferent, apathetic, and lack critical thinking, they just go along with what they are told, never bothering to check with the primary sources. Other than the places where I express my own opinion, I affirm that this story is true. If you hear anything different than you are being lied to or being given bad information, the things described in this video is the final straw that broke the camel's back. As of December 2013, I no longer believe in the Greek Old Calendars movement. They have never given me any good reason for why they should be considered Christian or Orthodox. Here is another example of the unethical corruption and character of the type of people ordained in the GOC. There was a time when I was in regular email correspondence with GOC priest Father Maximus Moretta, always believing and trusting that our correspondence was private. I had clarified previous confessional sin so there would be no misunderstanding. I even asked Father Maximus if he was going to share my previous confessional sins with anyone, and he said he would not. But one day, Bishop Christodoulos emailed me from Father Maximus' email account and said it was an accident, that he meant to email me from his own account. This tells me that there was no privacy. It was never made known to me that Bishop Christodoulos had access to Father Maximus' email account. When I asked Father Maximus for an explanation for this violation of my privacy, none was ever given and no apology was ever issued. This is another thing you would see in a cult or in a group with thought reform characteristics. Criteria number four, confession. There is no confidentiality. Members' sins, attitudes, and faults are discussed and exploited by the leaders, end quote. 
And yet Father Maximus once told me that I need to regain trust in clergy. Well, it's certainly not going to come from GOC clergy. These people have never given me any reason for why they should be trusted. Another important piece of information. When I was getting ready to join the GOC, Father Maximus had once told me that I could not attend any mainstream Orthodox church. And then one time when I did not know what I know now, I asked him if I could pray with them, but just not commune. He said I could. His later statement contradicts his previous one, and his later statement violates the canons and teaching of the Holy Fathers that we are not to pray with people we believe to be heretics. This kind of hypocrisy and contradiction is what we find among false traditionalists. Folks, there has been a major injustice committed against me by the GOC. I gave them plenty of time to repent and rectify the situation, and I gave them time to stop their 2002 encyclical violations. They have done nothing, so I feel it is my orthodox duty and responsibility to expose them. Let us compare their lack of empathy with scriptural teaching. In St. John 6.37, Christ said, Him that comes to me I will in no wise cast out. Bishop Sergius cast me out, and the GOC did nothing about it. James 2.15-16 says, If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled. Notwithstanding you give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? I was destitute of the food of the Holy Eucharist. 1 John 3.17 But whoso hath this world's good, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? I had the need to be around fellow believers and the need for communion, but the GOC shut up their bowels of compassion. The way we treat others is the way Christ will treat us at the last judgment. In Matthew 25, Christ condemns the goats with the following statement. For I was in hunger, and you gave me no meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you took me not in. Naked, and you clothed me not. Sick and in prison, and you visited me not. Then shall they also answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee in hunger, or a thirst, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister unto thee? Then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as ye did it not to one of the least of these, ye did it not to me. I submit that a person who has the fear of God would be very concerned about this passage, as they should be. And of course, we are all familiar with the parable of the Good Samaritan. This concludes my story. Now, what about this Bishop Sergius Black, also known as David and Alfred Black? I did some research on him and found some interesting things. Evidently, his reputation precedes him. The Pokrov website said that they received complaints about Bishop Sergius when he was in Hakna. Also, I spoke to one person who used to know Bishop Sergius and attended his church. This person described Bishop Sergius as a nut, a nut job, a jerk, a piece of work, dysfunctional, and he lies through his teeth and I was told to stay far away from him. The person I spoke to said there was a choir director who felt like Bishop Sergius was making her go crazy. A certain Bulgarian family did not like him. Also, Bishop Sergius lied in the case involving his friend, the homosexual Father Michael Reimer. Father Michael was coming clean with the truth, but Bishop Sergius lied and was still giving the party line. His lies were obvious to everyone. Links to this case may be found in the description box below this video. Now, as I mentioned in my story, I explained how when I met Bishop Sergius, I had an intuitive feeling that he was a homosexual. The moment he walked into the room I was in, I sensed he was a homosexual, but I suppressed this thought because I realized it could have been a demonic attack on me. I bowed on my own initiative to receive a blessing, as I always do when I meet clergy, and if I remember correctly, Bishop Sergius did not make the sign of the cross over me, but only gave me his hand to kiss. I am now going to give evidence supporting my initial intuition that Bishop Sergius is a homosexual. After our trapeze meal was completed, Bishop Sergius was talking about some monk in another monastery, and he said that even with his long white beard, that monk was one of the most handsome men he had ever seen. It is not normal for straight men to refer to other men as handsome. During my research on Bishop Sergius, I came across three sources which corroborate my initial intuition and indicate that Bishop Sergius is a homosexual, even though Bishop Sergius denied he has ever been interested in men. He may be telling the truth, but it's difficult to know for sure since it is evident that clergy like him have little or no fear of God and little or no qualms about lying 
when it suits their purposes. One clergyman told me there were rumors he is a homosexual, and one post in a forum said that Bishop Sturgis' homosexuality was well, was well known when he was in the OCA. Lastly, I communicated with a monk at Holy Transfiguration Monastery, and he said that he knows a layman that once visited Bishop Sturgis, and when he went into Bishop Sturgis' trailer, Bishop Sturgis was sitting down with his chest exposed. Even though there is no proof of homosexual intentions in Bishop Sturgis, the layman sensed within himself that there was a homosexual energy in Bishop, in Bishop Sturgis at that time. The monk also told me that in the past when Bishop Sturgis asked them to send certain people over and they refused, Bishop Sturgis got all pushed out of shape and gave them the cold treatment or something along those lines. Even though there are rumors of a homosexual energy in Bishop Sturgis, I want to emphasize that he has denied being interested in men. I am mentioning this because I try to be as honest and accurate as possible. Another thing about Bishop Sturgis is that I once, I was told by one of his monks that he travels to San Diego once a month to give one man communion in his living room. He probably takes a plane, but the driving distance between Kelseyville, where Bishop Sturgis lives, and San Diego is 9 hours and 20 minutes. The distance between Kelseyville and where I live is 2 hours and 24 minutes. I was willing to travel the distance but was prevented as I have described and Bishop Sturgis has never once offered to bring me communion. In my story I suggested the possibility that Bishop Sturgis and some clergymen may be undiagnosed psychopaths. The terms sociopath and psychopath are often used interchangeably. I want to point I want people to understand that my suggesting the possibility that some of these men are sociopaths or psychopaths is a serious consideration, not a personal attack. We really don't know the backgrounds and mental state of people being ordained. When people hear the words sociopath or psychopath, they often think of some psychotic murderer or something like that. Actually, psychopaths and sociopaths appear quite normal and are not psychotic, although some are. Sociopaths tend to be charming and work their way into leadership positions in politics and business. So I think it is perfectly reasonable to consider the idea that they may also infiltrate churches, not for matters of faith, but for their own sick need to control and have people underneath them. The video called How to Spot a Psychopath lists nine main characteristics, some of which I believe describe Bishop Sturgis and GOC clergy mentioned here. These characteristics are as follows. Lack of empathy, lack of remorse, superficiality, grandiosity, irresponsibility, that is, nothing is ever their fault, impulsive behavior, compulsive lying, manipulative, and antisocial behavior. I also suggested that there may be cultic characteristics and thought reform in the GOC. I also believe other old calendar groups may suffer from these characteristics as well. Some Hindu cults believe it is spiritual not to show compassion toward other people. The Hindu researcher Carol Matriciana discusses this in her documentary called Gods of the New Age. She states, Within their belief system, they have to be detached and removed from their emotions and compassion, and their cruelty and inhumanness as, is seen as spiritual and excused as holy. End quote. If GOC clergy and other old calendar sectarians suffer from cultic or thought reform characteristics, they are not aware of it. <clears throat> In my story, I made reference to the statement made by a psychologist in 2009, and I explained how Bishop Sturgis and the GOC did not take the doctor's statement into consideration. I believe ignoring a doctor's statement is something you would see in a sociopath or a cult. This, this situation with Bishop Sturgis and the GOC has caused me much unnecessary stress and augmented my already pre-existing conditions of major depression, stress, and anxiety. <clears throat> Since the time Bishop Sturgis violated my right to attend church and the fact that GOC did nothing about it, I had developed vertigo, dizzy spells, which I never had before, and I have awakened at night in the middle of anxiety attacks. Anxiety attacks was not a serious issue in my life prior to these things. These symptoms have disappeared, by the way. Also, the problem with the RTOC has not helped either. In, 2000, in 2010, RTOC priest Father Vladimir Mordvinkin of Sacramento referred me to the Serbian Patriarchate for the Sacraments in total violation and contradiction of the RTOC's official ecclesiology, which considers the Serbian Patriarchate to be apostate. I asked Father Vladimir for an explanation for this. He never explained anything and never wrote me again. 
I reported this to his bishop, Stefan and Vladimir Moss, the person who pointed me to the RTOC, and they never gave me any explanation for this. The scandals initiated by Father Vladimir Morvinkin and the GOC happened around the same time. I do not have proof that these people are responsible for my vertigo and anxiety attacks, but of course it is possible. I do know that these things cause me unnecessary stress. If anything happens to me psychologically or physically, I believe the GOC is probably responsible for it because it could have been prevented. If you want to learn more about how RTOC priest Father Vladimir Mordvinkin pointed me to a parish in the Serbian Patriarchate, a church his own church claims to be apostate, see the link in the description box below this video. In my story, I also made reference to the fact I was slandered in a forum. I suspect the slander originated in a GOC priest, possibly Father Maximus, although I do not have proof. One of the things asserted against me in the forum was that I refused to accept answers. No evidence or example was given in support of that claim. It was just asserted against me. The claim is false. I never got answers from the GOC. When I asked questions and reported what Bishop Sirtis did, I was ignored by these people. With regard to the 2002 encyclical violations, Father Maximus had agreed with me that this was wrong, and he said the practice was going to stop. It never did, and look at where they are today. With the exception of relocating for the reasons explained in my story, I did everything I was told by the GOC from the beginning. It was also asserted against me in the forum that I refused to follow advice. This is another patently false, slanderous lie against me, and the person making this claim did not give any examples or evidence in support of his assertion, because none exist. Let's compare this lie about me with the facts. Let's take a look at all the advice I followed. I followed Father Maximus' advice that I not attend any parish in mainstream orthodoxy. I followed his advice that I visit his monastery. I followed his advice that I go to Bishop Sergius Church. I followed his advice that I be around people, but when I tried, I was prevented. I followed his advice in receiving the orthodontist treatment. Also, I followed Father Maximus' advice that I close my YouTube account. When I visited his monastery, he told me to close my YouTube account. The reason he gave was because my username had the word apologist in it. He said, I'm not an orthodox apologist. I agreed. I am not a professional orthodox apologist. When I got home, I deleted my account, even though I had the lives of 64 saints in 64 separate videos, some of which were quite lengthy. I also closed another account I had, which was not active, just to show God that I was willing to be absolutely obedient. While at the monastery, Father Maximus had also told me not to make videos about the GOC. I had never made any videos about them up to that time. I followed his advice there as well, but when I realized that they were not going to stop giving communion to new calendarists and that there would be no support and that they would not do anything about Bishop Sergius, I decided to make videos about them, exposing them for the frauds and hypocrites they are. There is one thing I did not follow Father Maximus' advice on. I once asked him if I could have creamer in my coffee on a fast day. I wasn't looking for an economy. I wanted to know what the church's teaching was on this. He said I could have creamer. I chose not to because I do not believe people should be spoiled with those kind of economias. In a nutshell, I did everything I was told by the GOC, but I was treated like garbage. The person in the forum also claimed that I used to make videos wearing a hockey mask, obviously trying to discredit me in the reader's mind by trying to paint the image in the reader's mind that I'm some mental nut job. And then later in the same post, he changed it and said it was a ski mask. This is another example of the kind of lie one would see in a careless psychopath who has no conscience and no concern for detail and accuracy since he doesn't respect the person he's talking about. I have never in my entire YouTube experience ever worn a hockey mask. Either the person making this claim doesn't know what a hockey mask is or he was uncritically relying on slander or intentionally lying. In my original account back in 2007, I did make a few videos wearing a small black eye mask which was purchased from Walmart, but this was due to vanity because I wanted to hide dark spots under my eyes due to lack of sleep. I admit this was odd, but people do odd things on YouTube. And at that time I was not repentant to the degree I am today, but I never once wore a hockey mask or a ski mask in any YouTube video ever. If anyone suggests otherwise, demand they give you proof. They won't be able to because it never happened. I also want to point out how quickly the accusation changed. 
in the very same post the alleged hockey mask evolved into a ski mask. This shows how inattentive people are to detail and how quickly lies and slander grow and spread. A hockey mask is not a ski mask. I don't have proof, but this slanderous lie about me may have originated in Father Maximus since I shared with him one of the videos where I wore the eye mask. I reported the slander to GOC clergy but never received an apology because in the mind of a psychopath, nothing is ever their fault. And they lack a normal conscience, which would bother a decent person. And they lack fear of God and have absolutely no respect for human beings. I don't have proof that the that GOC clergy are psychopathic or sociopathic. It's just an opinion based on my experience with them. This is sad, people. What happened to me in my GOC experience to come away with the conclusion that they are psychopaths? I should not be thinking like this if it is untrue. I should be viewing these people as saints and stalwart guardians of the faith, not psychopaths. With regard to the lack of justice in the GOC, we see this in my story as well as the fact Metropolitan Paulus got away with the slander of Archbishop Gregory. I am now convinced that the justice system in the GOC is more primitive, corrupt, and undeveloped than the American justice system. If the leader is corrupt, then there is no higher court of appeal. There's really nothing you can do. Lastly, the GOC under Archbishop Kalinikos recently went into communion with the Senate in resistance. I believe this union was inevitable, and I predicted it would happen even before I knew they were in dialogue with each other. I believe this union vindicates me in all the previous videos that I had made about the GOC where I consistently spoke against their 2002 encyclical violations. Most of those videos have been removed, by the way. And I believe this union reveals the true colors of the GOC and was doomed to happen. I have a new prediction. This union will not last. It is only a matter of time that the bishops in these two jurisdictions discover the true colors and motives in each other. Since these people are ambitious and selfish and lack true Christian love and true Christian camaraderie, and because this union is not of God, it is doomed to failure. I know this has been a long video, and I thank you for your patience. For more information, see the description box below this video and click the button that says About. I will finish, I will finish with a quote from St. Felix III of Rome. An error which is not resisted is approved. A truth which is not defended is suppressed. He who does not oppose an evident crime is open to the suspicion of secret complicity. By the way, I sent this quote to some GOC clergymen and never received a reply. All it would have taken to prevent this video from being made is for Bishop Sturgis to have repented by letting me go to his church or for the GOC to defend my right to attend his church, which was the only GOC parish I had. The GOC is responsible for this video and for my exposure of their hypocrisy. I have recently come to learn about three families who sought refuge in the GOC but were also pushed away by Bishop Sergius Black. I thank you for your time and for watching this video.